So Dr. Neese, what were some of the major findings from your research on shellfish asthma? Well, um, as you know, the study was done quite a long time ago. It was a three-year study that went from 2001 to 2004, and it was done in four unionized plants in the province. Those were the only plants that we were able to gain access to at that time. Um, we were trying to get um, older plants, ideally, because we wanted to get a sense of, based on the research, we knew that the risk was likely higher if they worked longer. That was the suggestion in the literature at the time. Um, but the oldest plant we were able to enroll in the study uh, had been operating for 10 years at that point in time. Uh, and then the other plants were relatively newer. Uh, in terms of the overall findings, um, there were multiple parts to the study. Uh, I would say that we we learned, for one thing, that workers, you know, were not always very well informed about occupational asthma and allergy to snow crab in terms of its causes and its consequences. Uh, sometimes they they had they were more fearful perhaps than they needed to be. I.e., they thought that all types of asthma would be caused by work and so on, but in other cases they really didn't uh, and hadn't had explained to them really what this was, that it was at this point, even by 2001, 2002, 2003, a well-documented hazard in shellfish processing. Uh, they So they didn't necessarily have that information and they didn't know at the time that once you develop symptoms, the research was suggesting if you continue to be exposed, then the risk of developing chronic asthma that could be triggered not just by workplaces, uh, but by things outside of the workplace, such as exercise or painting or or so on, that 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 was a serious risk. Um, you know, so the 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 early experience with occupational asthma to snow crab was that, you know, you go to work and you eventually you start to develop symptoms. It could take, you know, a season or two. It could not happen maybe for 10 or 15 years. It might take a long time. People really vary, um, but they would go to work um, and then they would start to have breathing problems. Eventually they would start to use various kinds of uh, puffers, what they call puffers and other types of medications because you could also it could also manifest as a skin problem it's an allergic reaction so it isn't always respiratory it can also be skin based um, and then at the end of the season you, know, you put your puffer away and uh, you know and then you would feel okay during the winter and then you go back to work but the problem was if you kept doing that there was a risk that you would continue to have asthma symptoms year round, that it would affect many parts of your life, uh, and that also that the severity of the asthma could increase. And we certainly talked to some people who had very severe asthmatic challenges uh, in the course of that study. I mean, to the point where they were having to go to the hospital in order to continue working. Uh, they would load up with medications at the beginning of the season so that they would not have work interrupted because they desperately wanted to keep their hours. They didn't want to miss work um, uh, and so on. So, but the, so there was very strong pressure to keep going to work, to take medication. They were paying for all the medications themselves. There's very little in the way of evidence of workers' compensation support at that time. Uh, you know, and they were paying for their own masks and they were paying for for pretty well everything themselves out of very low wages mm -hmm. uh, and really just trying to make it through the season so that they would get their EI eligibility and then continue to to work there. And they, they were very clear the reasons for that were that there wasn't a lot of other work around in their communities. They're mostly single industry towns. Uh, and they needed the work, and they loved their work. That was the other thing, despite the serious health consequences that they were experiencing, 
work had meaning for them. Uh, and it was a source of companionship and friendship and as well as a, as an income and, and so on. So the, the effects were striking uh, to me, but also what was striking was the limited information that they had. And this was really for most of them, the first opportunity they had uh, to actually get a diagnosis, uh, to find out what it was that they had and to get some uh, medical and other advice on, on what they might be able to do and also the risks of continued exposure. But, you know, that was one group of workers, one point in time, I think a very important study. There were very few studies like that at the time. Um, but, you know, I keep wondering, well, what's happened <laughs> in the last, you know, that was that we wrapped that up in 2004. We had uh, more than 40 recommendations for a working group that we were involved with that had labor and employers and workers' compensation and government were all around the table. Uh, so what's happened since then is is the question I always ask. And when, you know, we know that there would be workers out there who have now been, you know, working in that sector for 30 or 40 years, you know, if they, if they survived that period of time. And I, you know, I look at the industry now and they're saying, well, we have a labor shortage. Nobody wants to work in the industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, we, we actually made a documentary film. Uh, it was a drama after we finished that study. And when we wrote the script, it, you know, it's basically a mother and a daughter and the mother doesn't want her daughter to go to work in the plant. And why would the daughter want to when she sees her mother seriously ill? You know, at the end of the day, she can't do things. She sits in a chair. She's having terrible time breathing and, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, I do wonder if the labor, the so-called labor shortages that we have in this sector now are really a product uh, to some degree of the, the working conditions in seafood processing in the province and not just crab asthma there's also research on work-related musculoskeletal disorders and they're serious issues uh, for these workers and you know i hear managers say well you know the work is hard and people don't want to do it there's a kind of fatalism there as though it has mm -hmm. to be that hard it has to be that dangerous um there is no alternative but we don't live in a world where there is no science and no information on either ergonomics or occupational disease. And there is, there are things that are known uh, that can be used to reduce their prevalence.